That time of the year again. Right flipping flapping now. It is the deadline for the Japan Mech Scholarship application season. Meanwhile, I have been in major cleanup mode, getting ready to update you guys on a huge life update that I know is taking too long to get out there. Big updates coming soon, but while I was cleaning, I happened to notice that it has been four years since I graduated my program in Japan. I've been meaning to do this video for a long time, so today we're just gonna do it. Everything I loved and all the things I regretted about going to university in Japan, do I regret quitting my life in the States? A cozy, cushy, high paying job and starting over as a student in Japan. Adulting in another country, taxes, the cost, the money. How hard was it to do it all in Japanese from the application to the university itself, to classes, to straight up just being not only the only American, but definitely the only black woman in my classes. And how much Japanese did I actually need to get through university in Japan? Everything from a pep talk to some real talk about about everything about my life and going to grad school in Japan. And for all the new faces out there, hi, minasan konnichiwa. Watashi wa Loretta to imasu. Yonen mai ni Yokohama Kokuritsu Daigaku no daigaku in wo sotsuyo shite, ima wa Nihon de shakkai jin toshite <laughs> if you like what you see, pep talk, real talk, go ahead and hit like and subscribe. So to start things off, the first thing that I kind of regretted was the amount of time it took leading up to to get into University of Japan. When you look at the original application online, I'm telling you this website, this next website, it looks fake. It's hard. It doesn't work half of the year. It, around spring it comes around and it looks like HTML blue from the 90s that nobody uses anymore. And you're like, what is this? skim. Yes, it's real. And yes, the application takes about a year to do. If you come as a university student, you have kind of like a prep year. Uh, when you come as a research student, which is what I did, the grad school level, you basically have the year before of application and then the year when you land up to two years. So anywhere from one to three years where there's just this time sink and you're like, like what are these papers? And what are these clear files for like a whole year? There's not really a visa long enough to let you stay in Japan to do the actual processes of getting into the school, getting used to the campus, getting set up, getting a bank account, getting your phone, getting all these things. So that actual first year as a research student, which really just means audit student, it means you can go to school, but you're not getting graded during that time. You can just audit the classes as you get ready and study and get ready for the entrance exams and then take the entrance exams and then do interviews, all of that. It's actually just a really nice cushion. So while it seems like a ridiculous time sink where you're losing out of money or far away from friends, it's actually a really amazing way to get set up in Japan. So next is picking the actual university that you will go to. Some of you have heard of a few common universities in Japan, but there are a lot more and a lot of them have more benefits to apply to. Like I said, I went to the grad school at Yokohama National University, which is one I had never heard of before until I went through the application process. And not only did I love my school because the campus was beautiful and it was just great, um, but it had an amazing perk in that this school got me an extra five points towards a highly skilled professional visa, which is the top tier work visa basically that you can get that gives you a fast track one year track to PR permanent residency here in Japan. There is actually a secret, a top secret list of schools that'll give you extra points towards the highly skilled professional visa if that is something that you're looking into. So one of the biggest perks of the MEX scholarships is that it actually sets you up for permanent residency a lot faster than if you came here via a work visa. So let's say you go to school, graduating the school gets you points. If you pass the JLPT N2 and especially N1, you're going to get even more points. If you have any full-time work experience before you came to Japan or after when you start your job, that's gonna to count towards points. And judging by the age guidelines, you're probably going to be somewhere between 20-ish and 35-ish if you're going through MEXT. That again will earn you more points. So just by going through this program, you're almost basically set up for the highly skilled professional visa. If you graduate, become employed at a company in Japan, and just have those basic things, especially if your university is one of those on the top secret list, Link below. then kaboom, you're basically set up for a 
one year track to permanent residency in Japan, and then straight chill it. Another question I get is usually about the undergraduate level, asking about if you have to take the math test, or if for any level, if you have to take the entrance exam, the actual entrance exam. You don't have to. If you are on the research grad level, you can actually just stay as an audit student for up to four years if you switch schools in the middle and do a personal project. But if you stay on and you actually do the entrance exam, go through the school and graduate, you're basically setting yourself up for permanent residency and easy peasy life, like a green card here in Japan, if that's something that you want. So you don't have to, but I do recommend it. And for the math test, that's actually this, this elusive math test that you guys are always commenting about. This is something that's uh, for the undergraduate level. So if you don't want to take basically an SAT in Japanese, you can just wait until grad school to apply. But for those of you who are taking it, I did make a video with my friend and we go through the math test steps over there. The common question that I get is how much Japanese do you actually need to get into the school, to get through the classes? and survive. I did my program completely in Japanese. Like this is an HR book. I had to do HR law stuff in Japanese and that was rough. Every single week, every single day. And it was, it was a lot. But if you want to study Japanese, put that in the application. They want to see that you're enthusiastic about it. But in general, you don't need to be able to speak at the beginning point. There are programs that are in English as well, and you can find schools that offer English programs. But there is a language school aspect at most of these schools where they will teach you, train you in Japanese, the classes will train you in Japanese, and they will kind of set you up for success that way. One quick regret slash tip that I wish I knew. This is something we've been talking about over on my Discord a lot about the actual wakugumi, the skeleton of how and what an outline, how to outline your whole like research proposal. Um, if you're able to actually do that in Japanese, it looks really good on your application, but be aware, it's also gonna bite you in the butt because if you get to the interview level, they are going to ask you in Japanese to defend your proposed research, to defend yourself. The more Japanese you show, the better your application will look, but the more they're going to grill you on Japanese before you get there. Nihongo no shoute sto coming to an application interview near you. Oh gosh. <laughs> but that actually brings us to one quick shout out. I wanted to let you guys know that if you are trying to learn Japanese, today's video is actually sponsored Thankfully, thank you to Story Learning, which is a program that offers a Japanese course of full immersion and contextual juicy mm -mm, goodness learning in Japanese through the link below. I have a special link with a seven day free trial. Immersion and introduction into Japanese based on your level that fits to your level of Japanese, wherever it may be, based on stories. Within the stories there are cultural notes, so you're getting more of a real immersion of what Japan is actually like, not just Japanese grammar, A wa B this, A ikoru B, dake jenakute, hontou ni real Japanese, real world knowledge that you can maybe even use on your application, you never know. No. One of the perks that I really like about story learning though is that they actually take these story based narratives and courses in Japanese and they grade them at the JLPT and two and four and three intermediate levels. So not only can you pick content based on your own pace, based on your own level, you can kind of contextualize it in terms of that test that we all love so much. So thank you so much to Story Learning for not only sponsoring this video, but for giving us all something relevant and new to enjoy and kind of sift through. So yeah, there will be a seven day free trial in the link below. Check it out if you're interested and let me know what you think. So with the MEX application, one of the incredibly difficult things that really busted my butt was the actually picking the research proposal and figuring out what should you do, what should you propose. One of the things that you have to make sure you outline in your actual research, in your application, in any level of the MEXT, is you have to add a sense of timeliness or relevance and urgency, or basically all the same thing. You need to make sure what you're writing or what you're proposing sounds like something that's happening right now in Japan. It's relevant. There's recent policy change, there's recent 
literature, there's a new academic research or a phenomenon that's come out. Something has come out in this year, Reiwa 5, 2023 and beyond, whenever it is that you may be watching this, there needs to be a relevant piece of why your research needs to happen right now, why you are the person to do it, um, why you're going to be a kakehashi. This is a keyword, kakehashi, a bridge between your old country and your new country, Japan. And what greater impact are you going to bring to your communities in both countries? Think of it like this. The MEC scholarship is actual tax dollars. People in Japan paying tax dollars to bring you all the way to Japan. Japanese tax dollars on your research just because you like Japan. Why is your research even worth it? I've done the research. This is the literature. This is something that I have to be in Japan at a Japanese school, at a Japanese library, with Japanese resources, with Japanese teachers, with case studies, with these companies. I need to be able to interview these exact companies in Tokyo, and I need to be able to take my findings to these organizations in Japan and back in the States. I need to be able to actually do this right now, this year in Heisei for me, but Reiwa for you guys. You have to add a sense of urgency, a sense of emergency, because just saying, because I love Japan is not enough. So therefore, I have to say one of the things I loved about the scholarship, obviously, was the scholarship itself, the stipend. In addition to having all of your tuition covered, it also gives you a actual stipend to use every month, which means a chunk of money goes into your account every month. You can actually use that easily to prove a dependent visa for your family. It's not a lot of money, but it's enough money if you're pretty frugal, and it gives you enough breathing room to really just focus on your studies if that's what you want to do. But this brings me to one of my bigger regrets. The day you get accepted, you have just a few weeks basically to decide okay, yeah, I'm gonna do it and get on a plane and you're out of there. So there is not enough time at that point to start processing sort of your your exit procedures from your home country. That, that better be your pen going taking notes because this is something I really wish someone had told me. Especially if you're a US citizen, when you leave the US, there are a lot of things that you no longer really have access to. So I'm talking about now stay with me on this one. I'm talking about taxes, investment accounts, Roth IRAs, 401ks, your student loans, those fun things, all of those fun things. Japan doesn't really have the same sort of investment schemes as the US does. So whether it be for yourself or if you have a family and you have kids and you wanna set up like school accounts for them, Japan has crazy high taxes, crazy high gift taxes, even when you're giving to your own family. And it becomes really expensive to try to live beyond each paycheck if you haven't already set something up in the States. If you leave your school loans just sitting there getting dust and mold and rust, if you leave your credit score besmirched and you leave it that way, by the time you actually try to go back to the States, it's going to be so hard to reset up your life again in the state. Trying to lease a car, trying to get an apartment, just do anything that requires credit, which is a lot of things in the States. Do not do that. Pay all your taxes in all countries, disclaimer. It's almost like these are the things they should have taught us in school. Along the same vein, if you use any sort of medicines, medications, make sure you talk to your doctor and do the research about if you can bring prescriptions over. Loretta, why don't you just use healthcare in Japan? It's so much better and so much cheaper. No, it ain't. It may be cheaper, but it is not better per se. And Japan is not really a country that believes in painkillers. A lot of major procedures are going to be very raw and brutal rawberry in Japan. So unless you want to feel those needles and scalpels and everything else, I would recommend getting as much of that, especially prescriptions and medications, whatever it is that you need to live well, um, I would recommend looking into all of that in your time before you come to Japan. So last kind of regret is picking a job afterwards when you leave the MEX program. There is still to this day not that much support, job support, to kind of get you from student life to working life. And when I graduated four years ago, the only options that were really in Japan, even if you had experience, unless you were a software developer or like really into code, really your best opportunities were at companies like Merikari and Dentsu and other Japanese firms like that. But there weren't really these big fang companies, you know, Netflix, Facebook, Amazon, etc. You probably don't want to work at a Japanese company. Like a small company, sure. But the big companies, they really don't have a great track record with hiring foreign talent. And it can be a really hard, 
uphill journey to try to find a workspace, a work environment that actually resonates with you and that you actually do well in. The landscape has changed now, so you don't just have to be a coder, you don't just have to be an engineer. The word project manager didn't even like really exist in Japan yet. That was just agio, like just sales, pushing accounts and things like that. Auxiliary jobs to tech and etc. These didn't really exist until the last two or three years or so. Real talk, real advice to all of you would be that when you're in actual school, doing all this research and busting your butt, start looking into companies, maybe even use them as case studies in your research, maybe actually while you're a student, reach out to them and see if you can do an internship, work part-time. This is a perfect time. And this is one of my loves actually. This is my favorite way to kind of get my foot in the door was to do it while you're a student. This whole MEX program actually kind of sets you up for the highly skilled professional visa. Okay, so let's leave it there for now. If you guys want me to cover more about how to write your research proposal, how to go through the actual wakugumi, let me know um, if you're still interested in that sort of stuff in a comment below, and we'll do that in another future video. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. All right, get ready for that big life update. <laughs> cliffhanger, cliffhanger. All right, bye.